I'm the symposium editor for the USF Law Review. Uh, before we start the program, I have a couple of we things. We can't hear you. Okay. It is on. Uh, our hashtag for today, if you'd like to tweet about this event, is hashtag USFLR. Um, they have it up front, too, if you want to ask. Before we start the program, I'd just like to take a few moments to thank everyone who has worked so hard over the past year to make this event happen. Uh, our sponsor today, Palantir, for their generous support. Professor Susan Freewald, who has served as faculty advisor and so much more for the symposium. Anita Ayers and Danielle Shalapsik, who have done such a beautiful job coordinating this event. Uh, our communications team, Angie Davis and Carolyn Boyd. The Office of the Dean and the USF Law Review Board for making this a yearly law, USF law tradition. And of course, our amazing speakers and panelists. Uh, we are so honored to have you here. Thank you for coming. Now, without further ado, here's Professor Freewald to open the program. Thank you so much, Jessica. She's done an amazing job organizing this symposium. Um, Dean Jeff Brand wanted to welcome you all, uh, but he was taken ill, and so he sent a physical avatar in his, in his absence. <laughs> I am now Dean Jeff Brand. <laughs> Dear colleagues, I am so sorry that I can't be with you today for this important symposium that puts in sharp relief the wonders of the technology revolution and the challenges and threats it poses to our fundamental rights. All one has to do is peruse the title of the panels, regulating the cloud, mapping our privacy, and in the name of safety, to understand the importance of the work upon which you embark today. Dean Brand is often very serious. <laughs> and what a lineup from the bench, the bar, the government, practice, industry, the NGO community, and the press to debate these issues of such great import to the well-being of the republic. If I were with you, I would have paid special tribute to our wonderful students, smart and committed for their tireless work in putting this together. I like to think that our great faculty inspires our students to do good work. What the students often don't understand is that their work inspires us. This symposium is a perfect example. So to all of you, our students, our panelists, our staff, and yes, Professor Freewald, to you too, my sincere thanks for making this symposium a reality. I wish you well on your journey today. We all have a lot riding on your success. Jeff Brand. <laughs> and now, as Professor Prewald, I would like to welcome you to, uh, and thank you so much for coming to our event, uh, especially on this beautiful day. I really appreciate your taking the time to come, and uh, I hope that you learn something. I hope that we learn from you as well. Um, and uh, I hope that you meet some people you didn't know before. Uh, I think that's the point of a symposium in part. Uh, I wanted to remind you that if you have good things to say about our symposium, tweet at US, uh, hashtag USFLR. If you have any complaints, uh, please write them down on a small piece of paper and take them outside to one of our uh, hosts and they will uh, do the appropriate thing. Um, let's see, what else? I just, uh, we'll have more thank yous later, so I don't wanna take any more time with them now. But just to let you know, as you'll see, uh, we have a great lineup of speakers, panelists, mo uh, moderators, keynote speakers, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about our thoughts with the primer that we're going to start with, with Professor Paul Ohm and myself. Um, as you'll see when we do the primer uh, and throughout the day, uh, ECPA, uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, is a very confusing, convoluted uh, area, a statutory set of rules. And so we thought that we would uh, start out the day just reviewing those rules, the structure of the law, uh, so, that, so that we would really save time for our panelists, so that they wouldn't have to spend time at sort of ground zero each time they wanted to speak. Um, I know uh, we planned that for the morning just so that we could set up the day that way, and I really uh, wanna thank you guys for showing up for the primer. Uh, later in the day, if people show up and are looking at each other saying, I don't understand what the speakers are saying because they missed the primer. That'll then be the opportunity for you to turn to them and gloat and say, well, you should have been here for the primer, and then you would know what they're talking about. So that's, that's our plan. And uh, so without further ado, I welcome Professor Paul Ohm um, from University of Colorado. I also thought because we have so much substance today, we wouldn't spend a lot of time on introductions. So I encourage you to read the speaker bios um, in your packets. You can, of course, Google people like never before. 
Um, I will say Paul is, uh, is one of the premier ECPA geeks uh, and has deep experience prosecuting ECPA uh, crimes, uh, using ECPA and teaching it and writing about it, and so it's a real thrill to be up here with him to teach it to you. So uh, we are going to, um, to, to uh, engage in this primer uh, about ECPA, and we are going to talk both about the underlying case law and the rules themselves. And the way we've divided this up is um, I'm going to be doing the talking when it's about the cases, and Paul is going to be do doing the talking when it's about the statute. And, um, and we know that this is going to be completely seamless, and there are going to be no awkward transitions of any kind. Why don't I kick it off? Okay. Um, so thank you, Susan, for having me out here. Susan didn't mention that this is an encore, that we did this in 2006, a similar symposium um, of the Law Review. Uh, and the volume of articles that came out of that have really stood the test of time. I mean, there aren't enough scholars who are ECPA geeks. I wear that as a badge of great pride. Um, and Susan has uniquely been able to assemble us, what is this now, every six years. and so in 2018, I'll be expecting my next invitation. Um, and it's such a great opportunity, but a primer is a very good idea. This is a notoriously complex set uh, of statutes and case law. Um, I once blogged uh, kind of, you know, the way law professors, you know, shake their fists at one another, and I said, my statute is the most complicated statute <laughs> in the US code. Tax people, come on, bring it on. Um, and it might have helped that all the readers were ECPA geeks, and they said, no, we're with you. <laughs> so it's not really as complicated. Um, OK, but to, to help kind of situate both uh, this explanatory uh, tutorial as well as all of the panels, um, we, we deployed high-tech technology to film an online crime as it happens. Um, so here's what it is. Um, and I, for those of you who have ever done any talk on the internet, you've used icons like this. So the depiction here is the laptop um, where maybe a victim, but probably the criminal is sitting. And then we have the ever famous cloud, uh, which represents the internet. And then over here we have a uh, big boxy 1998 era computer um, representing the server. Um, or the other communication on the other side of the cloud with which, let's just call it the criminal to be consistent, uh, is communicating. Um, and so, you know, on the internet, this really does become the scene of the crime. Uh, and what I have is, and you are about to be blown away by my PowerPoint animation skills. Um, so we have communications, you wanna see that again? Communications uh, that travel across the internet. Uh, from the criminal to some other computer, um, and then travel back, of course. Um, this becomes the scene of the crime. And, and so just to be really concrete, what are we talking about? Well, this might be someone downloading child pornography, which is a federal felony. This might be someone transmitting via email a threat to someone on the other side. This might be co-conspirators in a terrorism plot or an organized crime plot using some sort of chat software to have a conversation. Um, but the bottom line is the behavior of modern crime increasingly takes place in a diagram like this. Um, and what's most important for today's discussion, and the thing that we will really be talking about all day, is this, which is all throughout scattered parts of this network, there are traces of the conversations and transactions that are taking place. Uh, we tend to kind of divide this into two broad classes, although there's a lot of overlap. We have non-content transactional behavior, uh, evidence of behavior. Um, so we know that this person perhaps sent an email message, although we may not necessarily know what that email message said. Um, these transactional records tend to live in what we call log files, so just text files sitting on computers. Um, and, you know, the important part here, well, before I get to the important part, um, then there's also content records. So we know that the file that the criminal in my first scenario uh, downloaded is actually a file containing child pornography. How? Because we have a copy of this file. Maybe we kick down the door and seize the server. In fact, one of the big themes for today will be 
how things get ever more complicated when the real world and the virtual world begin to collide. Um, and so there's content, but the important thing that I uh, referred to a second ago is this data may live in lots of different places. They may live on source computers, they may live on destination computers. Increasingly, you will find traces of them somewhere in between if you just know where to sit because the internet is such a vastly intermediated space. Um, and so you might be able to find the choke point and sit there instead. This is the goal of every FBI agent, every police officer, uh, every US Secret Service agent who investigates crime online. And increasingly, that's all of them, right? We're not talking about hacking. I mean, we are, but we're also talking about every crime. I mean, virtually every crime committed today can be aided or abetted through an internet communication. And so the crime scene becomes important to agents everywhere. And so the, the theme, the major question we're facing today is, and this is really like high quality graphics, um, what, what do you do with the, uh, the jaunty police officer who wears his collar button a little bit, unbuttoned a little bit? What do you do uh, if you're a police officer and you want access to this information or this information or this information? Um, how do you comply with the law uh, and obtain the information that you seek? And more importantly, and let's not lose sight of this, it's not just how do you comply with the law, but how do you strike the correct balance between the civil liberties and the freedoms of the people who want to use the internet um, and the very desperate need for law enforcement to make sure that they can find and bring to justice people who commit crime, okay? Um, so that's kind of the basic scene of the crime, but I wanted to show one more thing, which is one of the key distinctions we're going to be talking about in this tutorial and throughout the day um, is that the statutory law governing this area, and increasingly the constitutional law as well, makes one critical distinction. Okay, they make the content, non-content distinction I've already described. Content is considered more private. You typically need to do more to comply with the law to obtain it. Um, but the second one is, if the police officer is coming to the scene of the crime after it has been committed, and what they want to obtain are records that have already been created and are sitting on a computer some way. We're talking about what we call stored or transactional surveillance. On the other hand, when you see this, you know, and I'm sorry, this triggers seizures in anyone, but when you see this, <laughs> I'm, what I'm trying to indicate here, and let's see that again, that was too impressive. Oh no, okay, um, sorry. All right, never mind. When you see it flashing, that's supposed to indicate what we call contemporaneous or perspective or real-time surveillance. What does this mean? This means we have identified the place on the network we want to surveil. It could be this person's uh, internet account, it could be an email account they are interacting with. It could be a child porn server that you know um, is showing ongoing evidence of a crime. When can the police, the metaphor we use is sit on the wire and watch these records before they're ever generated as they're being created? Or in some cases, not being created. When can the police generate entirely new records of behavior that never would have been stored before? And so, for, especially for the students in the room, begin to think about, should that matter under the law? Uh, does that seem more violative, more worthy of protection than the prior example where it's stored data that's been sitting around for a while? Uh, and as you'll see, many, many times throughout history, courts have said yes. Okay. Not, not many, many times. Sometimes throughout history. Not enough as far as uh, Professor Freewald wants, no, no, has many. argued. Okay, so that's, I'm not gonna dwell like this on every slide. I just wanted to make sure we understood kind of the basics of the investigation. I'll refer to this picture a couple more times. So let me, let me speed through a little more quickly. This next slide actually, I've done most of the hard work here, uh, which is to say if you wanna be an expert in this field, um, you have to understand dichotomies, okay? Uh, dichotomies are ever present throughout the constitutional law and throughout the statutory law. And so let me say one thing about that distinction first. Um, Susan and I are doing the kind of um, tag team here because this is a body of law that was first evolved constitutionally, but only in a very limited sense. The Supreme Court and lower courts have kind of tiptoed around the Fourth Amendment and told us in some ways how it should apply, especially to telephone communications. Um, but Congress filled the void really quickly and began in a surprisingly early time to begin to regulate the privacy of communications on networks by statute. Uh, the, the big statute we're going to talk about today, the star of the show today, 
the Electronic Communications Privacy Act was promulgated in 1986. When I worked at the Justice Department, we used to talk about this internationally, and people would always raise their hands and say, I think you made a mistake. You said 1986. <laughs> you know, we didn't, the internet didn't exist in 86, of course it did. Um, but, but it really, the, in many ways, the United States was a leader in 1986 by having this law. This is a quick and dirty breakdown of what the Electronic Communications Privacy Act provides. Um, there are three parts of it. There is what we call the Wiretap Act. There's the Pen Register and Trap and Trace Act. And there's the Short Communications Act. You may hear someone sloppily refer to Title Three. Title Three is a synonym for the Wiretap Act. It refers to the title where it first appeared uh, back in 1968. The Wiretap Act actually is older. Okay, so dichotomies. Here are the two dichotomies that matter most. I've already said them to you. One is, is it prospective, contemporaneous, or real-time surveillance? If so, you're in this column. Or is it retrospective and stored surveillance? If so, you're in this column. Are they seeking content? If so, in real time, that's the Wiretap Act. Non-content, that's this Pen Register Act. Um, if they're once stored, then you're in the land of the Stored Communications Act. And God help your soul, because you're, you're in big trouble. Um, OK, so let's begin. Let's just work our way through this chart. We're going to begin here. We're going to begin talking about what happens when the police want to do prospective surveillance of email, of web traffic, of chat, of accesses to Facebook, and let's not forget of the telephone network as well. Same, very similar rules apply. And so just once again, so you can see my handiwork, um, this is the situation we're going to talk about. Okay, I've spoken for too long, so this is a perfect time to segue to Professor Freewald. Are you controlling the slides? What? Are you, are you, can I have that clicker, the, um, no, the red thing? Oh, the this is the seamless handoff you were talking about. Yeah, this is cool. Okay. Okay, so um, before we get the, so Paul did a great job setting it up, and we, we have to back up a little bit to go before the 1968 legislation, which is the Wiretap Act. And um, he said the star of the show is ECPA, which is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, because that's what we're ta gonna talk about reforming. That's what all of our panels are about today. Um, ECPA just celebrated its 25th anniversary, um, and many of us believe, I think all of us believe it's in dire need of reform. The question is what kind of reform. Um, I think in a different way the star of the show uh, is the Wiretap Act because I think the Wiretap Act um, has the kind of standards and, pr and procedural protections in it that ECPA should aspire to. Uh, and to understand why, we have to look at these um, Supreme Court decisions that per direct, directly preceded the Wiretap Act. Um, and so the first one is CATS. Um, this, you guys should all have studied this, you lawyers in uh, criminal procedure. Um, and the CATS uh, decision in 1967 uh, established that the, the Fourth Amendment protects people and not places, uh, and established that uh, whenever we have a reasonable expectation of privacy, uh, we, uh, the law enforcement conducts a search under the Fourth Amendment when they uh, grab information subject to this reasonable expectation of privacy. So this was the case that established that we have privacy in our phone calls. Uh, and uh, the reasonable expectation of privacy test has two parts. We have to actually view our information as private and it has to be something that, and that, that um, expectation has to be something society views as reasonable. Um, uh, anybody who's been, uh, who paid attention to the Jones case that just came out a couple of weeks ago by the Supreme Court knows that the reasonable expectation of privacy test is, a, is a, an interesting animal because the courts have a tough time with it. And such a tough time that in fact, um, the majority in Jones avoided applying it. And I love the way uh, Justice Scalia and Jones said, if necessary, a revert to the reasonable expectation, expectation of privacy test uh, could happen in another case. But, they, but let's find a way to avoid applying it this time. And, and we'll, I'm sure, talk more about that throughout the day. So I, I put up here some questions about the reasonable expectation, expectation of privacy test. One of the most important is how, how do you determine when it applies? Is it a, something that, you know, do judges, are they supposed to look at um, empirical studies? Are they supposed to just know? Um, isn't it circular to say we expect things to be private when they're private? Um, uh, one big question is, is, is it a normative question? Things are private when they should be private. Uh, and I've argued in some of my scholarship that actually that is the way to determine this answer. Um, and that is the way the court did it in the Katz case. And I'm sure we'll come back to that. But, but I think underlying the Katz decision was uh, the vital nature, and this is what a quote from the case, the vital nature of the telephone network requires that phone calls be private and that we have the protections of the warrant requirement when law enforcement agents search our phone calls. 
Um, the Berger case is a little bit less um, discussed in Noma, but it's an important case that actually hap uh, was decided six months prior to Katz. What's important about this case is that in the case, the court recognized that electronic surveillance has some particular features that make it um, uh, particularly in need of extensive judicial oversight. And the court talked about that both the uh, problematic features of electronic surveillance and the particular uh, constitutional requirements of judicial oversight for electronic surveillance. Um, and some of these were particularization, in other words, a, a very close specification of why you think you have reason or probable cause to believe that the, the perp that you're after has committed a crime and that you're gonna find evidence of that crime on the stuff that you're searching, um, how you're going to minimize the acquisition of non-incriminating communications, the fact that you're using this very intrusive method, this electronic sur surveillance as a last resort and other techniques haven't worked, um, the requirement that you give notice to the target. The target has to find out, not beforehand, because that would kind of defeat the purpose in a lot of cases, um, but afterwards, certainly, so that the target can bring a claim, um, and some other safeguards that were designed to avoid what the court said would otherwise be a general search, which is something that our founding fathers um, were very much concerned that we not do in the Fourth Amendment. So, so these are the decisions that spurred the Wiretap Act's passage in 1968. And the question is, um, to, what, to what extent are other types of uh, surveillance subject to these rules? You can hold on to it. I don't really need it. You sure? <laughs> yeah. Just something to point at things. Um, I feel like, uh, like we're at the Oscars, right? <laughs> so, so the winner for best privacy statute is. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, think I, I think I typed this wrong. Burger B. New York. Yeah, it's New York. Yeah, it'd be New York. So for those of you looking this up, you won't find Bur Burger B. New York. Um, so in the wake of these statutes, Congress decided to act, and Congress enacted in 1968 my favorite statute name ever, the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968, <laughs> Title III of which was the Wiretap Act. Um, you will see in about five minutes or ten minutes, I'm going to spend seven slides on the Stored Communications Act. That's largely because that's what so many speakers will focus on today. I'm only going to give you two on prospective surveillance, um, and they're... Uh, they're confusingly using similar looking tables. I probably sh should have had better mad PowerPoint skills and change this a little bit. Um, these, are, these are new. Um, and so what I've done here is I'm giving you the nickel tour through prospective surveillance statutes. So these are part of ECBA. And when sometimes people are really lazy, they will say ECBA when they mean the Stored Communications Act. And it's that point that you're, now that you're all going to be ECBA geeks in training, if you're not already a geek, you slam your fist and say, no, you mean the Stored Communications Act. So the Wiretap Act will be represented in the left, the Pen Register Trap and Trace Act in the right. That's fitting because they are very parallel provisions, even though they treat the privacy in very different ways. Okay, category one, what is covered by the statute? Um, the Wiretap Act regulates police access to the content of communications. If I remember correctly, contents is defined as the substance, meaning, or purport of the communication. Um, what the Wiretap Act interestingly applies to three forms of surveillance. Uh, wire surveillance, which is wire communication surveillance, which is traditional telephone wiretapping, climbing a phone pole and sticking alligator clips on it. Um, it applies to electronic surveillance, which uh, covers all basically computer networks. Um, and it also applies to something we probably won't talk about much today, which is oral surveillance, which means it's a it's illegal under the statute to hide a microphone in certain contexts uh, in your office, in a nanny cam, et cetera. Um, Paul, that Paul, let's it, can, I, can I just interrupt and sure. say, just to be clear, the Wiretap Act of 1968 covered <laughs> phone calls and bugging. Yeah. And then what happened in 1986 is it was, is ECPA yeah. amended the Wiretap Act to cover electronic communication. Right. Thank okay. you. That's an important clarification. So ECPA is what really brought this into the network age and ultimately into the internet age. Um, the Pen Register Trap and Trace Act um, applies to, you know, I've said non-content, and that's basically right. Um, but the strict definition, and this is actually something, here's a statute we haven't talked about today, that was introduced in the infamous USA Patriot Act. Uh, and for those of you who only followed the USA Patriot Act debates, tangentially, you should know that, you know, 50% of what they were fighting about was amendments to ECPA. They changed ECPA in some significant ways, and arguably none as significant as this. I'm sure others have different nominees. Um, the Pen Register Act now applies to any surveillance of dialing, 
routing, addressing, and signaling information. This is going to have an important bearing when we get to the cell site location conversation that will occur later. But for those of you in the room who have ever been a network engineer or done anything with network engineering, you look at those four words and you ask yourself, what does that not cover? I mean, everything, especially signaling, right? Everything on a network is a signal. And so arguably, the Pen Register Act covers anything on a network that's not content. Now, that's arguable. I'm sure there are some people in the room who are going to have counterexamples. How do we know it doesn't cover content? Because there's a provision that says not including content. In other words, go see the Wiretap Act if what you want to do is content. Let me give you some examples. Um, and these are examples that are, I think, pretty beyond dispute. Um, if you want to get in real time, in real time as it arrives, the body of an email message, you're going to need to get some sort of wiretap permission. Um, if you are content to live with only the to and from on the email message, uh, you probably can do it with the lower pen register authorities. Higher for wiretap, lower for pen register. More privacy for wiretap, less privacy for pen register. That's the way this breaks down. Um, number two, what if you want to intercept uh, the voice phone calls, uh, the content that people are saying to one another? And this would apply equally to the uh, plain old telephone network um, or to modern VoIP systems, including Skype. Um, that's the content of communications. If you want to do that in real time, then you need to look to the Wiretap Act. Uh, if instead you're content to look at only the numbers that are being dialed, well, now we're talking about the Pen Register Trap and Trace Act. And for those of you who have been confused about this, um, that's where the name comes from. A Pen Register is an old time telephone system that could track the number of, uh, sorry, the telephone numbers that you dialed on a given phone. A trap and trace worked in reverse. It would remember the numbers of the people who were calling in, a little like caller ID. So that's why we call it this. We call it this even though on the internet it goes way beyond that. Okay, so I keep saying more privacy, less privacy. What do I mean by that? Here are some examples. Um, these are both criminal statutes. If you don't comply with the requirements of the statutes and you do this sort of prospective surveillance, and by the way, by you, I mean everyone in the United States, not just the police. Um, if you violate the wiretap provisions, you are violating a felony provision that could put you in jail for up to five years. This is federal. There are state counterparts to every one of these. Um, if you violate the Pen Register Trap and Trace Act, it's only a misdemeanor punishable by up to one year in prison. And this is actually quite critical, although it may not come up a lot today because we're focused so much on law enforcement. If you violate the Wiretap Act, the person whose communications you intercept is provided a civil suit with some very significant statutory damages provisions. And so there's a very strong incentive for private citizens uh, to help enforce and extend the Wiretap Act. Kevin Bankson, who's sitting in the front row, um, tried to use this provision to great effect to sue AT&T uh, when he was at EFF for assisting the National Security Agency in the warrantless wiretapping program. Um, so that's the civil suit. The pen register critically has no civil suit provision. And so I've talked to company counsel who have talked about like their ISP handling behavior. And I've said, doesn't that violate the pen register act? And without thinking, they blurt out, well, there's no civil liability for that. And so I always get to like, you know, take a sip of my wine and say, um, so counsel, you're advising your client to violate a federal criminal law because they can't be sued. And then they walk away and we'll find the <laughs> Okay, but again, that's probably a little beyond the scope of today's But there's, there's also no notice to the target. And there's no notice to the target, right. The wiretap has obligatory eventual notice provisions, uh, and notice is a huge part of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the Pen Register Act does not. But here's the critical difference. I mean, this is the one that drives people who think about ECPA insane. And it, I'm going to, let's, let's play the Oscars, okay. This is my nominee for the single worst thing about ECPA today. Um, is the difference in this next line. Um, it's not the Wiretap. The Wiretap Act is a, is a model for very strong privacy procedures when it comes to situations where the police decide they want to do prospective content surveillance. In fact, I say it's unparalleled, and this is the burger requirements that Professor Freewald averted to. Uh, you know, one that really I, I love to talk about is the necessity requirement, the last resort requirement. You can't get a Wiretap Act order 
unless you've dug through the person's trash and tried to infiltrate their network in the real world and you've done some you know, on the street surveillance, you, know, you can tell the judge why you're not gonna try these things because they're so likely to fail, but you still have to do that. I mean, there, there are no other procedural statute that I know of that requires such a strong necessity requirement. The Pen Register Act requires almost nothing for the police to do it. You're gonna hear people grumbling throughout today about things called the 2703D order and subpoenas. This is worse than all of those. What the statute says is the police must go to a judge and the word they use, the verb they use is certify. Certify that the information thought, sought is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation. You're done, full stop. Judges have interpreted this in written opinions to mean that the judge plays essentially a magisterial, I mean, a ministerial role, that you read the piece of paper and you make sure it's signed by a law enforcement officer and you make sure somewhere in there there's one sentence that says, I certify that this is relevant to an ongoing criminal procedure, you're done. Um, so no independent review of facts. Sorry. What's that? No independent review of and the no facts. No independent review of that. Uh, that because of, and we'll talk a lot about this, because of the way the appeals work at the magistrate level and the district court level, no independent review of that. You can't ask for facts. You can't ask them to justify it. Um, and so I think almost everyone in this room who deals with ECWA all the time agrees that this should be fixed at the very least. But that's just silly. That we're talking about to and from information numbers dialed. We're talking about lots of things. We may even be talking about the URLs you are visiting in your browser. There's a little debate over that. Um, can be obtained without the judge ever really knowing why the police needed it or how they justify it. And remember, it's the mere relevance standard. So from, for those of you in law school, you've encountered the relevance standard. You know how low the relevance standard is. Um, okay, so that's pen register. Now, there are situations where, and I just put this for completeness, where the police um, can conduct this type of surveillance without going to a judge first. Um, and the two that are probably the most important, and although I put them um, kind of in a unified box here, there are some subtle differences between how wiretap does this and how the pen trap does this. Um, if you have the consent of one of the parties to the communication, then you are allowed to conduct the wiretap without ever getting a court order. Um, and so this is why the police can put wired informants into a room and tape record the conversation with the other person. The Supreme Court has said that doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment. The wiretap act says that that doesn't violate the statute. Um, this is also why um, you can you know, go to Radio Shack and buy a $15 device and stick it on your telephone and tape record uh, the conversations because you're a party to the communication, you know you're doing this. Now, for those of you who are about to do this, Not in California, yeah. let me point out one thing, which is state statutes in 12 states differ. In California. 12 states, the rule is it can't just be one party to the communication, it must be all of the parties to the communication. This is why when you call customer service lines, you will often hear for customers, for quality assurance purposes, we're gonna record what you're about to say. If you want, you know, the implicit idea is you're consenting to that recording. California is all party consent state. Colorado is not, so, you know, I, I left all my tape recording devices back at home. Before um, you go on, are you gonna talk about um, ECPA uh, and uh, the, the um, lack of a statutory suppression remedy for electronic communications? Uh, I think you are, it's on one of your slides. Oh, that's okay. Later. okay. Um, and then, provider protection really briefly is uh, people who run networks are allowed to do some limited wiretapping and pen trap like activity in order to protect their rights and property. Uh, there are systems called intrusion detection systems. Uh, there are firewalls that watch behavior. And these are all legal, by and large. I've written articles that sometimes they cross the line um, because of this exception. Um, okay, so this one's yours. Okay, um, so. <laughs> So we left, is, the, the order is a little odd, but that's, that's okay, bear with us. Um, so we left off with the question of um, how far, when else uh, do the burger requirements apply other than to phone calls, and in burger it was um, bugging, electronic surveillance, bugging. And, um, and it's a really important question because as you can see, and as Paul started to lay out, the, the statute um, covers some, some things but not others and, and we'll talk more about how the, the, con the statute is deficient in many areas. And so what I want to tell you is the Supreme Court has, uh, and, the, uh, and the lower courts have not extended the Berger uh, rule far at all. Um, and again, uh, in Jones they didn't even get into reasonable expect the majority didn't get into reasonable expectation of privacy. There's only one area where they've clearly, um, until recently, 
said that the burger requirements apply beyond uh, the acquisition of phone calls, and that's in the silent video surveillance context in which there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, in other words, um, not silent video surveillance in public, but silent video surveillance um, in a home or in an office or in sort of a private place. And, uh, and in those cases, um, and I've written about this, the, 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 and this was not the Supreme Court, it was seven courts of appeals, and they applied the Wiretap Act requirements, the, the content, real-time requirements that Paul just went through by analogy, and uh, rather that because the statute didn't apply, and said that because this form of surveillance was also intrusive, continuous, hidden, and indiscriminate um, as electronic surveillance is, we should apply those very high-level requirements that we've been talking about, like minimization, last resort, et cetera, to this form of surveillance as well. So I raise this, and we could have put this slide somewhere else, but we raise it here just to sort of um, say this, this is an argument that we can make when we talk about how the Fourth Amendment maybe should be coming in for some of these new technologies and requiring more than the protections that Congress has given. And so we'll talk about that more soon. And specifically email, right? You've, you've argued. Yeah, I've, yeah so I've story. argued that, um, yeah, thanks for reminding me, yeah. that, that, this, um, that these factors, that these features characterize acquisition of email, um, both in real time and out of storage, um, that these factors characterize acquisition of cell site location information, uh, and that these factors characterize acquisition of GPS tracking data. So um, I've been filing some amicus briefs in the last five or six years and making these arguments. Um, and uh, the courts have uh, not really bought it, I would say that. Um, they've definitely, and we'll talk about this, improved the protection of, um, uh, improved the protection of some of these new technologies, but not all the way up to the burger requirements. I have a strange thing is that's the first time the courts have declined to follow a law professor's suggestion for how to change the law. So I don't know what's wrong with these. Um, okay, so let me do a quick transition. I'll hand it right back to you, which is we're now going to move to the right half of the diagram I put earlier. We're actually going to spend a little more time digging into some of the specifics here because they will become so important throughout the course of the day. Um, we're no longer talking about prospective surveillance. We're talking about the collection. Surveillance may not even be the right word. The collection of data that currently is stored on the network for some other reason, often because some internet service provider has decided that this is a record that they want to keep around for whatever reason, or perhaps a user has decided that this is an email message that they don't want to delete. Um, so what does the police encounter when they go to a provider and ask for stored previously created records? And so just to remind you of the diagram again, no blinking arrows this time. Um, the police are going after the fact. Uh, and once again, as with wiretap in Title III, uh, the best way to kind of understand why Congress has done what it's done is to look first at the constitutional law. Okay, so these are um, the cases that, uh, in, oh boy, there's another little typo here. What did I do? Uh, Smith versus Maryland is 1979. Oh, okay. Sorry. And I, I don't know. It, it, I typed these in. I, I used, I had yours on one screen and typed. And okay. It was late. <laughs> I might have had a drink before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, as we said, 1968 Wiretap Act followed the Supreme Court cases of Katz and Berger. Then, in between the Wiretap Act and ACPA, which was passed in 86, we had these two Supreme Court cases. So, Miller in 76 and Smith versus Maryland in 79. And these are the, um, the last until Jones, really, well, pretty much until Jones, the last statements by the Supreme Court about surveillance of communications. So, in 1976, um, the Supreme Court looked at this question of whether um, Miller had a reasonable expectation of privacy in bank records stored with his bank. And, um, and it was, it's important to know what these records were. And, and uh, there were checks and deposit slips, and also I forgot to mention um, account statements that Miller had, that, that his bank had. And, and Miller was a very, very bad guy. He was running a still. And he hadn't paid, um, like a whiskey still. And he hadn't paid, I think, $10,000 in taxes. And you should know, he had terrible lawyers. I read his brief, and it was sort of stream of consciousness, his brief. And he was up against the star-studded cast of government lawyers. I think this is significant, because the Miller case has been so important in the development of constitutional law, and it was such an unfair fight. Uh, I think Bork was one of the lawyers who opposed him, was working for the Justice Department. I mean, there's really names you would recognize. And the Miller's lawyer, I'm telling you, he, wouldn't, he wrote his brief late at night, um, didn't even raise a First Amendment argument. In any case, 
Um, the Supreme Court said that Miller did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in these records um, because he had knowingly and voluntarily, knowingly and voluntarily shared them with the bank and bank employees used them in the ordinary course of employment. And so the big question, uh, and therefore, just to finish it out, the um, law enforcement agents could acquire these records using a subpoena did, that did not involve judicial oversight. They did not have to have a probable cause warrant that would be overseen by a judge. And so from that case has come what I always put in quotes, the third party, and I would have, the third party rule, um, because it's very controversial how far it extends. And um, law enforcement, Department of Justice litigators have successfully in many cases argued that the third party rule extends to any information stored with a third party. That any time law enforcement is acquiring or asking for information that they're getting from a third party, that information is not subject to a reasonable expectation of privacy and we have no uh, right to expect a, that law enforcement's gonna get a warrant for the information. They don't, we don't have the right for a judge to review the demand for our records. Um, I think there's a much better reading of Miller um, and, and recently judges have started to recognize this that has a narrow reading that limits it more to its facts and says, well, only when the facts of the acquisition are closer to Miller in the sense that it's a knowing and a voluntary sharing of records with another party. Because in this case, actually, again, if you look at the information, these were, uh, this, we, these were instructions to the bank. A check is an instruction to the bank. A deposit slip is an instruction to the bank. Um, and it's different from a case where you're uh, an intermediary, for example, your cell phone provider or your ISP has access to your information. Um, and if you think about it, if you take Miller too far, then you run headlong into CATS because CATS, the phone, in CATS, the phone company had access technically to your phone calls and yet you had a reasonable expectation of privacy in them. And similarly, the postal service has, has access to your mail and yet you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that. So big dispute that we're still working out is how, how broad should we interpret this third party rule? Again, um, those of you who read Jones uh, saw Justice Sotomayor in her concurrence drop a, a page in which she said, I don't know about this third party rule, which was kind of manna from heaven for me. Um, Smith versus Maryland is uh, the other case from 1979 uh, in which the court said that we have no reasonable expectation of privacy in the telephone numbers we dialed. It was a case in which the uh, law enforcement agents were using a very early version of a pen register that acquired literally only telephone numbers dialed. So nothing like what modern pen registers can acquire. Uh, the pen register in Smith, I like to say this, people tease me about it. It, it, it acquired the information on a paper tape. It wasn't even electronic information and it was just telephone number. It wasn't duration of call. It certainly wasn't email address. It was certainly wasn't URL, IP address, uh, what else was attached, subject line, to from. It was the telephone number dialed. Um, and, but, it, but Smith versus Maryland did apply the Miller rule and there was language in that in which the court said information shared with a third party, namely the phone company, not subject to Fourth Amendment protection. Um, and so that has given the uh, law enforcement some support for its view that there's a broad third party rule. And it's important to recognize how these two cases um, inspired Congress to withhold some protection in ECPA, namely, um, it, it ex the Smith versus Maryland case explains why the pen register statute is so uh, non-protective because uh, Congress was felt that pen register information just wasn't protected. And also it, it, the Miller case explains the uh, lack of protection for stored information because the idea was uh, at a certain point, and as we'll see soon, it's that point is after 180 days. After 180 days, Congress felt that if your information, uh, electronic information resides with your provider after 180 days, it's, a, the, the, it's become the record of your provider. Now maybe that wasn't a bad idea in 1986. Um, I think today people keep emails, at least I do, six months or more because they're important, not because we've abandoned them. But I don't want to go back, go into the statute because that's Paul's territory. All right, so take a deep breath because now we're gonna talk about the Stored Communications Act. And for those of you who have never had the pleasure, you are really in for something. Um, here are some of the things I tell my students before I teach them this statute. Number one, your knowledge of the English language is about to disserve you. Because if you assume, the, assume these words mean what they mean in English, you're probably interpreting the statute wrong. Number two, I'm happy to see my good friend Richard Salgado at the back of the room. Richard basically taught me everything I know about the Stored Communications Act. 
Uh, and one thing that I used to informally say, and I think Richard believes this too, is at the Justice Department, in a unit where we worked, where a third of the lawyers did nothing but think about the Short Communications Act all day long, we had a rule that you had to be there for an entire year before you were allowed to talk about this statute publicly <laughs> because it was so complicated. Okay, so this is, you only need a year of study before you really will begin to understand this. The third thing I will say is, this statute has the miraculous ability to be resistant to human memory. So even when you think you do understand this statute, if it's been a month since you've looked at it, you probably have forgotten something important. So it's very simple, actually. This is all you need to know, okay? Um, this is the infamous DOJ ECBA chart. Uh, for people who aren't with the DOJ, this heading up here probably is driving them crazy. The traditional understanding versus the Theofel understanding. Uh, they would probably call this the DOJ interpretation versus the Theofel interpretation. That's the Ninth Circuit interpretation. That's, yeah, and we're going to get to that in a second. Okay. Um, I obviously am not masochistic enough uh, to try and walk you through every grid of this box. The way this basically works is if you're law enforcement and you want to obtain a piece of short information, you've got to read down the left side to figure out what category of ECPA, it says, sorry, see I just did it, the Short Communications Act it falls into, and then across the top you have to figure out what kind of provider you're dealing with and whether it's voluntary disclosure or compelled disclosure. I am really going to highlight maybe three of the features of this chart. One I'm going to highlight is what these first couple of rows mean and how they differ from the bottom. So this is the famous ECS-RCS distinction. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about this column here, what the police need to do to compel information from public providers, which are a lot of the providers that we're really interested in. Um, one thing Susan's already pointed out is this box is going to become, right here, is going to become a very big topic of discussion throughout the day. Why? Because it allows the police to obtain the content of communications and storage with something less than a search warrant. And if you think that the Fourth Amendment applies to stored communications, that very well may be unconstitutional. And when we now have a federal court of appeals, the Sixth Circuit, who has said that that box is unconstitutional. So among other things, we have a unconstitutional statute that you're learning about, at least in Ohio and neighboring states. Okay, so let's begin to dive for the rest of this. And we should probably make these slides available somewhere if people want a copy of this slide in particular. Okay. So here is, my goal also is to highlight the things that kind of have been the, the center of calls for reform, at least some of them. Um, okay, the first thing that um, people debate about the Stored Communications Act um, is to whom does it even apply? Which providers are covered by the protections? And really what we're really interested in is which users of which providers get the robust or somewhat robust privacy protections that Congress attempted to extend. And in many ways that we can't really get into in depth today, you really need to understand how the internet worked in 1986. Um, the internet in 1986 was a very, very different sort of network. And again, I'm not gonna play out exactly, the, I'll leave it to Jim Dempsey and others today to play out how that was, but the bottom line for all of you is there are very good arguments in this last bullet that very important services critically important services that track and collect your behavior in ways that you certainly don't want the police to have easy access to are not covered by the Stored Communications Act at all. That the police can knock on a door and if they find a friendly provider, get this inf information. But before I get to this last bullet, which I think may probably raise some disagreement in the room, let me talk about what I think we agree on. Um, it covers electronic communication services. These allow you to send or receive electronic communications to other people email, telephone, instant messaging, text messages, uh, Gchat, you know, some of these new Google Hangouts, uh, these are all ECSs. Uh, remote computing services. Uh, the funny thing is, if I'd given this talk eight years ago, I would have said, eh, they're not very important these days. But then we had the rise of the cloud, and the cloud has actually revived what we used to do. We used to store our files on some remote mainframe, or we used to use some remote ma mainframe to do a bunch of math for us. Eight years ago, we didn't really do a lot of that, right? We had an email account, but that was about it. Now, with the rise of Dropbox and uh, Amazon's EC2 and 
photo sharing services and Flickr. There's a lot more remote file storage that occurs today. Arguably, all of this is covered in some way by the Stored Communications Act. So what's not covered? Well, there's always been a big debate over the search queries you give to Google. And is that even applicable under the Electronic Communications, uh, sorry, under the Stored Communications Act? Um, there may be no more private pool of data in existence in the world, in my opinion, right? You tell Google your medical symptoms before you tell your spouse or your doctor, right? Well, you know, why, why is my mucus this color today? Um, it is highly sensitive stuff, and yet it may not be under the protections of the statute. Um, Google Books, which tracks which page you're reading of a particular book, or can, I, I should be careful, I'm not sure they do that. Um, YouTube, which videos you're viewing, the New York Times, uh, which, which uh, articles you've read that day, Amazon, eBay, there are lots of services that arguably do not even fall under the statute at all. Uh, I hope there's some disagreement, because it's always good for a conference to have disagreement, but that's my first initial bid. Okay, so let me get, just tiptoe you into some of what the police want to do. And let, picture you're an FBI agent working with an assistant U.S. attorney, um, and you are asking the U.S. assistant U.S. attorney, what do I need to do to get this information? Well, here are some of the examples. Um, the assistant U.S. attorney will first say, look, if all you want is information in this list, we call it basic subscriber information. This is all non-content, or arguably non-content, and all you need is a subpoena. Uh, look at some of the really important ones, the temporarily assigned network address. So for those of you who understand the internet, this is your temporarily assigned IP address. For those of you who don't know the internet, I'm not gonna play it out, but it means this is a very important tool to link you to your behavior online. Uh, that can be obtained with a subpoena. No notice to the user is required. What do you need to get a subpoena? I remember talking to a prosecutor in Georgia, and I said, what do you need to do to get a grand jury subpoena? He said, oh, it's that thing. It's this pad of paper he kept on his desk. And he would fill it out, and he would walk downstairs and have the clerk sign it, and then he would have a grand jury subpoena. Some jurisdictions require a little more. It certainly doesn't require you to go to the grand jury, the citizens. Uh, they are, it's under their authority you act, but you're not actually seeking their approval for it. Very, very low hurdle. Most importantly, no judge, okay? Um, what if you want other non-content information? So this is stuff that is not content, but it goes beyond that list I just showed you. Audit trails, uh, the identities of people who they're emailing with. This is corresponding in some ways with the pen register requirement. You can obtain this with a court order, but it's a very specific kind of court order created in the Stored Communications Act itself. For one of the big purposes of this tutorial is to just help you with the terminology. You will hear people talking about 2703D orders throughout the day, or they will just call them D orders. The dumbest thing in the Leahy Bill is that they will add a provision and make these 2703E orders. That's unacceptable, we can't have that. Um, so D orders require specific and articulable facts showing there is reasonable ground to believe they're relevant and material to an ongoing criminal investigation. Some scholars have likened this to the sub-probable cause Terry stop standard, reasonable suspicion. I'll leave it to other panelists today to talk about whether that's right or not. But again, no notice to the user is required. What if you want to get content? What if you want to read the stored email messages that someone has in their inbox? What if you want to find all of the files that they've stored in their private Dropbox account? Um, the rules are a little in flux because of this opinion out of the Ninth Circuit called the Theofel. Uh, when I worked at the Justice Department, I intentionally pronounced it the awful opinion. Um, <laughs> BFL, I feel differently about it now that I'm not at the Justice Department. Um, BFL um, requires that all email, and again, I'm, I'm cutting some corners here so people can flesh this out later. All email has the most heightened level of privacy protection, cannot be obtained with anything less than a search warrant. DOJ continues to argue outside the Ninth Circuit that BFL was inc incorrectly decided. They have a theory, and this is if this makes no sense to you, then that means you're following along. They have a theory that if you open up a piece of email, decide that it's a piece of email that you want to keep for whatever reason, so you close it, but you store it in your inbox, but it's now no longer bold, it suddenly plummets to a lower level of privacy protection under the Stored Communications Act. They no longer need a search warrant to obtain it. They're going to be able to obtain it with a mere subpoena or with one of those D orders. And again, if that doesn't make sense to you, that's one of the things that we've been talking a lot about. And it depends on where you're storing it. 
And it, you mean whether you're in the whether it's a subpoena? No, whether it's a subpoena or a deorder depends on whether you're storing it on a system that provides email to the public or right. not. Right. So if it's yeah, if this is your employer, your private employer, or your who university, won't give an email account to anyone or your university, you'll, it'll be even lower protection. I mean, that's that's the one square in the grid that is the hardest to remember because it's such a subtle distinction. Um, uh, again, subpoena, deorder, very low standard. Now, there is a notice requirement. I'm only going to say something really quickly. Um, that you are supposed to tell the subscriber you've done this. This is the first time we've said this today after a lot of statutes that don't require it. It may be delayed 90 days. It always is delayed 90 days. It's often extended in 90-day blocks. And there are lots of cases where no notice is ever served, and it's a little confusing how that can happen. Um, the other thing that is sure to be discussed today is the staleness rule. This goes to what Susan was saying about the DOJ's interpretations of those constitutional statutes. If you have a piece of email you've not opened or have opened and it's just sitting there for 180 days, for more than 180 days, Congress declared that it, you no longer have that heightened level of protection and privacy. Uh, and so DOJ can, with less than a search warrant, obtain all of that email. And no one disputes that. I mean, people fight over the Theofel interpretation all the time. The 180-day rule is black letter law. It's very obvious that that's what Congress intended. Now, the question we've all asked is, is that constitutional? Uh, that's a question. I, if it's a clarifying question, I don't want to, we're almost out of our time. I think it's, it's an additional tool to interact with that with, we're withholding email all of these communications that are not communication. Oh, I, so it's privilege issues and things like that. You have, we're, 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 we're exfoliation. Yeah, so there is some case law on when the Cert Communication Act begins to collide with other obligations for secrecy and privacy. Uh, and, and I don't think anyone suggests that this will override other doctrine that exists, but, but not a lot of case. I mean, this is. You have, the idea that if, if you have to, if you kept it for 180 days and it's now trash, then you're under essentially a shield of exclusion. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And, and I'm not sure. I mean, maybe other panelists can address whether they've seen a specific case about that. That sometimes we'd love to delete information, except you've got some other law that won't let us, yeah. Um, but it is a perfect segue, because Susan wants to highlight how we don't know answers to questions like that quite often. Yeah. So um, just so you know, um, we're going to take about five more minutes, and we're going to move the schedule forward a little th by that much. Um, the next panel, I don't know if um, we've told you yet, um, we had to, we've, one of our speakers is unable to show up for the next panel. And uh, we're very sad that uh, Al Ghadari, who we were really looking forward to having to joining us, uh, is unable to come. He had commitments that he could not get out of. He sends his deepest apologies. Um, he really, really, really wanted to be here. Um, and we will sorely miss him. We're really hoping he's able to uh, give us another great Law Review article like he did six years ago. Um, but it means that we can, that Paul and I can eat into their time a little bit. So we're gonna do that with another five minutes and then we'll stop, okay? Um, okay, so so question about cases interpreting ECWA, and there are very few. And there's just real, to, to tell you why, one is that uh, under many of the provisions there's no notice given. Um, there's no notice given under the pen register statute. There's no notice given for records acquisitions. My understanding is that even when uh, those, the um, statute requires that noti the, sorry, a warrant for email, the Department of Justice interprets that as not requiring notice if they get a warrant. So a, a lot of, um, and I know um, Magistrate Judge Smith, who's we're delighted will be on the panel on location data, is gonna talk a lot about this issue of how much electronic surveillance goes on without people knowing about it. Um, but you can't bring an action to contest something you don't know about, um, and so that's why there are very, it's one of the reasons there are very few cases is actu very few cases challenging ECPA. People don't know they've been targeted. Uh, even if they find out they've been targeted, uh, when ECPA was uh, added in 1986 for all of the provisions, Pen Register, Stored Communications Act, and even the real-time access to content, none of the provisions carried a statutory suppression remedy. Uh, the 1968 Wiretap Act has a statutory suppression remedy, um, but the 1986, because the, the Justice Department asked Congress not to include a statutory suppression remedy, Congress did not include one. That means that there's uh, much less incentive to bring a challenge if you are a criminal defendant. You can, and you can only have evidence suppressed in a, tr in a trial if you have a constitutional claim, which until 2010, there were no cases in uh, federal court uh, suggesting that you did have a constitutional claim. So we'll talk about that case in just a minute. But that's another reason that there have been very few cases. It seemed like you, what, what was the chance you were gonna actually succeed in getting the evidence suppressed? 
the damages have not been very significant for your civil claims to the extent you have them. They were up, they were increased, I think, in 94, but still you're talking $10,000, which is not a lot to bring a whole case. Um, and again, these are some other reasons that I know Judge Smith is going to talk more about um, for why a lot of this surveillance takes place without people finding out about it, which is a lot of these cases take place with just uh, law enforcement asking the judge uh, if there is, in fact, a judge involved for an order without the target being notified. Okay, so just really quickly, because I know the panels are going to talk about this, there has been a change in the law in the last two years. Uh, one is the Warshot case out of the Sixth Circuit. Uh, some of us worked on this as amicus. Uh, and uh, this, this case is the first case in federal court. We, there were a couple of cases in military courts before this in the 90s. Uh, but this is the first case to find that there actually is a reasonable expectation of privacy in email. This case involves stored email. And the court made analogy to phone calls and mail, uh, said that Miller does not apply for the reasons I suggested earlier, which is that the intermediary, the ISP is acting as an intermediary. Uh, it's not true that you voluntarily and knowingly disclose your email to your ISP, even if your ISP has some access for, for example, looking for viruses or, or maintaining their system. Uh, and therefore, to the extent that the uh, Storage Communications Act permits access to your email on less than a warrant, it's unconstitutional. Um, however, in that case itself, the Sixth Circuit did not grant Warshak himself a suppression remedy because he said the statute was, uh, it was okay for the law enforcement agents to believe that the Stored Communications Act was constitutional, they acted in good faith, but they dropped a nice footnote where they said, but this is the last time law enforcement agents can believe that. Uh, and the question then is, will this be adopted by other circuits beyond the Sixth Circuit? Uh, and in the meantime, will Congress fix the statute? And uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, Senator DeLahey has a bill where he's suggested fixing the statute, but so far, it hasn't been passed. So we now have five slides on location. Do we want to do it? I mean, we could also do it before Yeah, the why don't we not do it? Um, I mean, we could do it before the location panel, or we could just ask the location panelists to play out their themes on those instead. Yeah, why don't, let me just say that there have been some cases in the cell location context that have also importantly found uh, constitution, that have rejected Miller in uh, the, con the cell location context and um, and very importantly, Judge Smith is the author of one of them that we'll be talking about in the location context. And in the last few years, we've had some judges pushing back on the idea that cell site location data is just a third party record. And some very important cases have come up and are percolating through the courts right now. So I think we'll talk about those in the location panel. Um, but now that you know D orders and, uh, and, and the 180 day rule and Miller, I think we can stop, okay? So I don't think we'll take questions because we'll save questions for the panel. Um, but you're welcome to ask us questions in the break, which we'll take now for 15 minutes and then start the next panel at uh, 10.25. Thank you.